Welcome back everyone to another tutorial. This time we're gonna talk about everything regarding stems. Now what are stems? They're basically audio prints of your MIDI markup, but they're also audio prints of recordings you've made. Um, there are different types of audio stems for different purposes and they're made in a different way. So uh, the most common ones are stems for recording, stems for mixing, stems for the dub stage, and stems for video games. Now first up, recording stems. Those are usually some stems of the different sections of the orchestra that you need for recording. You can leave reverb and all other processing on those stems, it doesn't really matter. It's just for playback purposes during the recording sessions, especially when you're striping, because then you want to have the ability to turn things in the mock-up on and off. So when you're recording strings, for example, you can mute the mock-up strings, but you can still uh, play the brass and winds, percussion, everything else, so that the players recording the string lines can still hear everything else that's going on in the composition. And likewise, when you're recording brass or woodwinds, you can turn those off in the mock-up, because they usually don't want to hear them while they're playing, but you can leave everything else on for uh, playback purposes. These stems are completely discarded after the session, so you're not gonna use them for anything else. I often skip this step and immediately print the dry mixing stems, which we're gonna get to in a second. Um, but check with your recording engineer if this is okay for them because they're gonna end up with more tracks. So be sure to communicate that with them. Sometimes it can also be helpful to actually already have the split out mixing stems because, for example, the score I just recorded had a lot of mixed meters in it and um, it was a very rhythmic score so it was really nice that they could just push for example the high percussion and shakers and that type of thing on the headphones in the headphone playback of the musicians so that they could play more um, in time with the mock-up and with the click then you have mixing stems mixing stems are dry stems meaning you mute the reverb your engineer does not want that. They have their own reverb set up. They usually have a better reverb than you do. Um, but also they use multiple reverbs and everything. They have this whole thing going on. They don't want your crappy reverb on the stems. Usually for your mixing engineer, you would um, split out the stems more. So you would not print the sections, but you would print, you know, violins one, violins two, violas, cello, bass. Sometimes I even further split those out. Um, it really depends. I can show you the regular splits that I normally do, which you can see here, but very often I will split things out based on a Q by Q basis. You always need to make sure that um, you listen to the cue first and then you determine what kind of control does the mixing engineer need? What is he going to EQ together? For example, the high percussion, I very often split out into high woods and high metals because the timbre is just so different. If I have long strings and short strings going on at the same time, I usually split those out because I want to have separate control over these. But also um, synthesizers are usually tricky. I usually split those out very, very in a very detailed way. Um, so it really depends if you have a cello line going on in the tenor bass range, but you also have cello harmonics playing on top of that. I would split those out. So really uh, use common sense for um, EQ purposes, but also for the range of the instruments, what are they playing, what makes sense to have separately. Now you can go as detailed as you like, but it's always good to check with your score mixer what they prefer, if they prefer stuff further split out or summed into one stem. Uh, it's always good to communicate that. The number one rule is your Mixing stems that you deliver need to match your stereo reference 100% minus the reverb. Uh, it will get your mixing engineer very angry if they have to reverse engineer your pre-mix before they can start their mix because you didn't print any of your processing. If you've already done some EQing and you've already done some compression and all this stuff, you know, don't take that off because that's the stereo reference that the production approved. So that should be the starting point for your mixing engineer. 
Likewise, if there are specific effects that you have on your instruments that you really mean specific delays or really a specific colored reverb, you can leave that on too if you really mean that and you don't want anybody to mess with that. And then you have the dub mix stems. These are the stems that you eventually deliver to the dub stage where they make the score mix. Uh, I have a separate video about that kind of delivery, so check that out if you're interested in knowing how to do that. These are stems that are created from the mix after the mix is done. Very often the score mixer or his assistant will do that. They take care of that in usually in surround and Pro Tools. So there's not much the composer has to do in that case. You do determine what the stems are together with the dub mixer though. So it's important the composer communicates with the dub stage how split out do you want it. Um, very often they leave it up to my discretion, what I want to give them. Um, it also kind of depends on how you record it. If you recorded the full orchestra together, there's not that much you can do. But if you striped, uh, again, there's a video on those recording techniques. Um, but if you striped, then obviously you can give out way more split out stems. Now, these are usually summed stems, so you would give them all the strings together, all the brass, all the woodwinds, all the percussion, and then choir. Uh, you can see a list here of what I normally do. Um, and then there's like specialty instruments that you might want to print separately. Uh, be careful though, you want to give them options, you want to give them control so that if something doesn't work in a queue with dialogue and sound effects, they can turn that off or make it softer and kind of adjust the mix. You would rather give them the option to make proper edits and, and change the mix a little bit rather than have them turn down the queue entirely or mute it entirely. But at the same time, you also, of course, want to be careful. You don't want to give them too many options to mess with your music. You don't want to go to the premiere and wonder what kind of music that is because you never wrote that and they just completely re-edited the music. So, you know, find a good middle ground between giving them control but not giving them too much control. It's also advisable to deliver songs and stems. I've just done that on my previous two productions and I also attended the dub mix and if you've ever been at a dub stage or in a theater and you heard a song in stereo and you heard them distribute the stems in the surround field, it's day and night difference. It's crazy how much more powerful a song is when the stems are really distributed in onto all the speakers and the different elements can really play and really get pushed and really be audible. So if you have songs and you have the stems available, by all means deliver the stems so that they can really do their thing in the surround field and make the song more powerful. This is also why some songs sound incredible in theaters and you can't wait to go home and listen to the song again, but then when you listen again it sounds way less impressive because now you're hearing it in stereo and it's just, you know, not quite as cool. And then you have video game stems. Now this is a whole different thing uh, because you know, you're not really working to picture most of the time, but this is um, very important because in a lot of video games, you either score maps or you score gameplay that increases intensity or decreases intensity. So what you do is you write loops normally for games. And then what you give them are different loop elements so that basically when you're a gamer for example and you hit a certain threshold they want the intensity to increase so then they add another layer of the loop that you gave them and then you hit another threshold in the gameplay where the intensity needs to increase again and then they will add another layer the programmers need control to increase and decrease the tension of the music that is playing it's also nice if you're scoring a map and that map has a loop that is going on and on um, to kind of have variations whenever it repeats. And so you tend to give them the loops in different, um, in different intensity elements. But that's really, it depends on the composition how you do that. Now, how do you make those stems? Well, depending on your DAW, you can 
um, automate the process in various ways. It's always advisable to automate as much of the process as possible because the average movie has between, what, 40 and 60 cues, sometimes more. Um, and you have to do that for every single cue. So it's very time consuming if you don't have at least a portion of the process automated. Otherwise, it can become a massively time consuming task, which is also why this is often an assistant task. Um, but again, you know, make everyone's life a little easier. If you can automate the process, do it. So what you can see here is my signal chain from Vienna Ensemble Pro on my second computer and from within contact into Vienna Ensemble Pro into Cubase. You can split these out as far as you like. This is what I prefer because on my productions, th these are the splits I use mainly. But, you know, I know people who like to split out articulations further and I know people who like to split out different libraries or, you know, you, you, can, you can literally do whatever you like. The more split out you are from the start, the less extra work you're going to have if someone wants something split out further because then you have to print it separately. Um, so if you're fairly separated out from the start, that's advisable. Now in Cubase, you can batch export the channels. They're called group channels here. They're basically aux channels. In any other DAW, they would be called aux channels. So you can batch export these. So this is how I have this set up. Um, in Cubase, just uh, know that the reverb is not printed on this. You can print that on a separate track if you like, but I never do that because nobody wants my reverb. But then just also make sure if you use that batch function, whatever you have on the master fader is not printed into those stems. So whatever I do in ozone at the end of a queue to kind of, you know, correct frequencies and brighten it up or use tape saturation, maximize or whatever I do in there, um, I need to copy paste that onto all of those output stems so that it gets printed onto them. You can also um, print onto audio stems uh, in real time, which a lot of composers like to do. Um, it's a bit more time consuming, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to check your composition and check your stems before exporting. So I have this set up here mainly because in case I need wet stems instead of dry stems, but I rarely ever use these audio tr tracks that I have here. I rarely ever record enable them and then just print onto them. Another way of doing things um, that I've done at some composer studios that have a lot of hardware going on, a lot of hardware samplers that cannot offline bounce, is they have Cubase routed directly into Pro Tools, and then you hit record in Pro Tools, and you play through the queue, and they're locked through timecode, and then you print stems directly into Pro Tools. That's a very old fashioned way of doing it, and I would not recommend that because it takes forever and the outputs and inputs into Pro Tools are limited. And I just found myself doing this for hours and hours in the middle of the night and a queue that should have taken me, say, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to print offline, took me three hours to print in real time. But some studios have to do that because if you're using hardware gear that just doesn't offline bounce, you don't really have a choice. Some DAWs also have a really great bounce and place function that you can use. I use that a lot in Logic when I was still on Logic, but always make sure that your stems are all the same length and that they are time stemmed at the beginning of the file because that's gonna make the uh, Pro Tools session prep of whoever is doing the Pro Tools prep much easier because they don't have to input the time code from the file name manually. Again, there's a Pro Tools prep video that I've previously done if you want to see that. Now, know that you usually will have to do multiple passes, even if you're set up in a really split out way. There's just always queue specific stuff that needs to be printed separately. So doing everything in one pass is highly unlikely on a whole movie. Because no matter how well you're set up, there are just specific things you do in one queue that you didn't do on, all, on, on any of the other queues and you have to print that separately. So use your best judgment. Sometimes you can print all the high woodwinds onto one track because they're all doing the same, they're playing all in unison, then it's fine. 
but sometimes you need all of the woodwind soloists split out. That's just how it is. Sometimes you have specialty instruments going on that need a separate print. Sometimes you have, uh, like I said, different synthesizers going on that just need to be printed onto separate tracks. That's just the reality of it. But the more you can automate the process, the fewer passes you need to export, the more time you save, of course. So use your best judgment. What is the mixing engineer going to need to have control over? It varies from project to project, from queue to queue, but automate your processes as much as you can. I hope this was helpful and you learned something. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments, or if you have any suggestions for future videos, do that as well. Um, and I'll see you in the next video.